we have been studying forgiveness the last several weeks, and we ain't done yet. Going to keep talking about forgiveness for a couple more Sabbaths. Let me pray before I begin. Lord, we are so in need of you every day. And Father, in this moment, I just ask that it would be your voice heard here, your message, and that we would be changed because of your word that is spoken. We ask in Jesus' name, amen. All right, forgiveness and healing. I am going to jump right into the kids' quiz. So, Toby and Elder Cortad, thank you. I like to have the kids participate at the beginning of the service. I always include this little interactive time. Um, you saw we had a few younger ones here, um, but any of the young people, just help us out. I like to have you uh, participate uh, here at the beginning of the message. So, uh, some of this will depend a little bit on whether or not you may have been here or maybe you know the story. So, I preached last week on a particular character and the whole idea of him being carried to the table. Who was that? What was his name? I know you're a kid at heart there, George, but uh, why is he riding over here? Who was carried to the table? from last week's sermon. Hey, he did a good job. It's not the easiest name. Say it five times fast. It kind of sticks in your throat. Uh, I'm sure he had other names. Uh, even the Bible, there were different names for these individuals. But you have to wonder if he had a nickname. You know, did they call him Boshi? <laughs> did they call him Mephi? <laughs> or, or something like that. You know, just to say Mephibosheth all the time, it just doesn't quite roll off the tongue, but, you know, different, different culture. But yeah, that was the story of Mephibosheth last week. And you're going to see the theme of being carried here in these questions. Uh, how many Levites did it take to carry the Ark of the Covenant? You remember the, the Ark was carried on poles? Do you know how many would you guess? I see a couple hands. Uh, Dean, Mark, we got uh, Julian over here. We got Abel. Oh, they went right by you there. Go ahead, Abel. Let me hear what you have to say. Abel says four. Julian? Oh, the red mic. Is the red mic working? Try it one more time, Julian. I didn't quite hear you. Uh, red mic's got a problem, apparently. Sorry about that. But I heard Abel say four. Okay, Eric over here. Six. Oh, now we're hearing different numbers. I'm all confused. Kyle? Seven, that's a good number, holy number, seventh day of the week, number seven. Are we, no, let's, okay, Julia, let me hear one. Four. Four. I'm going to, we don't know completely, but there are at least a couple of occasions where specifically we're told how many carried the ark. We know the, the names of eight priests who carried the ark in First Chronicles. They're named, all eight of them. And in Joshua, it's explicitly stated that 12 priests were asked to carry the ark through the Jordan River. Um, now, that number may have been symbolic because they were using 12 a lot as, as the children of Israel went through the wilderness and came into the promised land. So, whether or not it required 12 or they just symbolically wanted 12, it's highly unlikely that it was four. For the simple reason is, the thing was heavy. It likely weighed at least a thousand pounds. Now, four robust guys can carry a thousand pounds, but if you're walking mile upon mile, now maybe they have shifts and things like that. I get it, but most of the time, you're you're uh, or, or most likely it was not designed for just four individuals. It was heavy. Now, people have built replicas of the ark, and we know that just by the building dimensions, and certain assumptions have to be made, just the empty box would have been around 600 pounds, the empty box. But by the time you put stone tablets in it, you put the other things that are in it, and the other element that is often forgotten is when they were carrying the ark, it was always covered. 
And it was covered with three specific items. The gorgeous veil that separated the holy place from the most holy place, that very intricate, densely decorated uh, veil, it covered the ark. And then on top of that was a heavy leather canvas that was pure white. And then on top of that was an additional blue, fine woven uh, uh, covering. It was the only thing that had three coverings. Everything else was covered twice uh, of the other articles, and they, the last thing was always the, the leather. So whenever you'd see the people marching, everything would be in white except for the Ark of the Covenant that would be in blue. So you put those three heavy things on top of it. It, it varies. Estimates vary, but it wasn't light. So we don't know how many exactly, but it was probably... This picture is probably not very accurate, and this is how you almost see, always see the Ark of the Covenant. Four happy little priests. Yay! Um, walking through the Jordan River here, you can see the water. First of all, it's not covered. They would never, in, in, when Israel was being faithful, they would never carry it uncovered. Um, and again, it was heavy, so it was probably 8 to 12 at times that were carrying the ark. By the way, I, I couldn't even find a good picture of what a biblically accurate ark would have looked like. This is the best I could do. I'm, I'm embarrassed to tell you how much time I spent on Google trying to find an artistic picture of the ark. Several of the times they're covered. This was a little tiny one that I blew up. That's why it's so grainy. So at least you see about eight priests carrying it, and at least it's covered. But um, it's hard to find a, a, a picture of it um, being carried probably in the more accurate biblical way. So it was, a, it was a, a, an endeavor that took several priests to participate in. Okay, moving on. Who helped Jesus carry His cross? Do you remember the story of Jesus? Now, just as the priests carried the tabernacle, or carried the tabernacle and carried the ark, which was the instrument of forgiveness and salvation, so also did Jesus in His passion carry the ark, or excuse me, carry the cross. So, Kyle, I saw your hand. It wasn't Peter, but that's a good guess. It wouldn't have been great if Peter had been there, but uh, Peter was not. John. Wasn't John. I know, I see your hand there. We're going to let the young people. It's someone that it just kind of appears out of nowhere and isn't one of the main uh, characters. Jacob. Simon of Cyrene. Simon of Cyrene. That is the actual, uh, was that what you were going to say, Julian? Uh, we're going to give you credit for it because I know that was what was in your heart. We don't know a lot about him, Simon. I, I've heard it pronounced Cyrene. I, I don't know perfectly. I'm not uh, 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 sure about that. We know it was a city in North Africa, not Egypt, Africa, Libya, what today is Libya, um, Africa. And most of the time, he's portrayed as having black skin. And he had been there. Now, we don't know that for sure. There's a lot of historical you know, analysis of that, but he was obviously someone was there and gets pressed into helping Jesus carry that cross, the instrument of his passion, but also of salvation. Okay, a couple more questions. I see Toby and Mark, they're ready to go here. A couple more questions for the kids. Remember, there's a story about someone being carried to Jesus who was paralyzed. It's called the paralytic, but they couldn't reach him because all the crowds were around him but they still managed to find a way to get this man close to Jesus. How did they do it? All right, Sean, with a little help. Lowered him by a roof. Lowered him by the roof. Partial credit to you, Sean. Nearly accurate. <laughs> oh, the brother, uh, Eric, is going to help out. Oh, they actually dug a hole. So between the two brothers, full credit. Full credit because they put the pieces together. They actually dig through the roof and open it up. I, I heard you say lowered from the roof, but that element of breaking open the roof, I think, is, is an interesting part of the story. They broke open the roof. Okay, last question before we move on. Um, there's a, a picture of it. Who knows what it would have totally looked like, but that's an interesting idea. The Bible says that Jesus, in this story, seeing their faith, right, the, the, the faith of everyone involved in that, said one of these things. Did He say, well done, good and faithful servants? Did He say, son, your sins are forgiven, or, or go and sin no more? Or did He say, hey, what'd you do to my roof? Okay, I see Abel... All right, and we'll let one more here. 
Okay, so you guys are, are good Bible students. You have great knowledge of the Scriptures because you're both right. Jesus said, your sins are forgiven. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, Toby. Thank you, everyone, for starting us off with the little interactive time. We're going to get into this story a little bit. I mentioned it last week. I think it's a wonderful story for analysis. But as we get closer, as we, we draw um, to the Scriptures, I want to pause and just look at this verse from Hebrews 4.16. It says, Therefore, let us draw near, let us draw near with confidence to the throne of grace, that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Now, this is one of many verses that expresses a similar idea, but I liked how it said it here in Hebrews. When, when it's referencing the throne of grace, don't forget the box that the Levites carried. The Ark of the Covenant was not simply a box that was the container of the Ten Commandments. On top of that box, the lid was called the mercy seat. They were literally carrying God's throne. That's what it symbolized. When the Ark of the Covenant was placed in the tabernacle, God would come and He would dwell on the throne in the most holy place. So it wasn't just a box, a, a, you know, a safety deposit box. It was His throne. So when Hebrews says, let us draw near with confidence to the throne of grace, any first century Jew thinking about what the throne would have been, been both its, its ultimate reality in heaven, but also how God had, had symbolized it on earth, their minds would have been drawn to that physical representation of the throne that sat in the most holy place. And when, when the author says, draw near, let us draw near. That's significant because that was one thing you weren't allowed to do before Jesus Christ. You weren't allowed to draw near to the, to the, to the throne, to the ark. Even when the ark was being carried by the priests, in the book of Joshua, at least one reference gives us a specific distance that the children of Israel had to stay away from the ark. It specifically says 2,000 cubits. And all of you well understand that measurement in today's measurements. We all understand how far 2,000 cubits is. Coach, you know, you're, you know how to measure fields. You understand it perfectly. No, I had to look it up. It's about a half mile. It's basically from here to Scottsdale. If you go out on the road and you look by and you see the cars whizzing by, right? If you look down Sutton and you see the road, that's about a half mile. That was the closest the children of Israel could get even to the ark that was veiled and as they were carrying it. They had to stay a half mile away from it. And then when the ark was placed in the tabernacle at the center of the camp and they would interact with it, although they could draw closer than a half mile, there were still all these barriers. They had to go through the courtyard and then the priesthood itself was a barrier between them and God. Ordained by the Lord, symbolically representing the work of Jesus Christ. I'm not saying that the priests were evil, but it was another veil. It was another separation between them and and the throne. They had to work through a priesthood. They had to work through a sacrificial animal. They had to work through the temple tabernacle. They had to imagine God through the veil. So this whole idea of drawing near was new. I mean, again, God is, is always with us. It's not that God was, was not able to be present in dramatic ways with His people, but in the symbolism of the ark, in the symbolism of the structure of worship that God had given Israel, there was an understanding of barriers, an understanding of distance. But when we draw near to the throne of grace, mercy and grace is found in help in time of need. Now, I want you to think about the different stories we've talked about when it comes to forgiveness. And I want you to remember this principle of drawing near in the context of forgiveness. The first story that we talked about, and it's not from the Bible, but it's from history and it's a dramatic story, of Corey Tim Boom meeting that German guard at the concent or that had been at the concentration camp. Do you remember that story? She's giving a lecture on forgiveness, for crying out loud, and out of the crowd walks this German soldier that she knew had been at that concentration camp, the very camp where her sister had died, and so much misery had happened. And as he's drawing near, she is repulsed. As he's walking towards her, she goes through that emotional reality. What is he doing? I know who he is. As he draws near, the whole 
subject of forgiveness becomes very alive. She even says, here I've been preaching on forgiveness and walking up to me as someone who I knew I could not forgive. And suddenly he's standing in front of her with his hand outstretched, saying, Fräulein, will you forgive me? And in the moment of that nearness, the power of God flew through her and she was able to reach out and express the forgiveness of God. When you think about Joseph, we talked about the story of Joseph, how he tested the reformation of his brothers when they come. We're going to go through these fast, so um, hopefully you remember the stories. And he reveals himself finally to his brothers, and he, he, he sends everyone out of the room. If you remember the story of Joseph, and then he reveals to them, he says in their language, I am Joseph, your brother. How is my father? They were so shocked they didn't believe it. And the very next words out of Joseph's mouth are, come closer to me and inspect and see that it is your brother. Draw near. Think about the woman caught in adultery. That was the next story that we looked at. It wasn't her plan to be brought near to Christ. That wasn't where she wanted to be at all. But she was thrust into the presence of Christ against her will with the attempt to destroy her life. But God in His mercy was able to work through that and and bring redemption to this woman because she had been brought near. What a radical change based upon what the, the Pharisees were trying to do. Instead of destroying Christ, a life is redeemed. Because she was brought near. And then last week we talked about Mephibosheth living at a distance from the king, living in Lodabar, hating David, wondering about his life until one day he is brought into the presence of the king and the grace of God is able to work through David in his mercy. And then he becomes as one of the king's sons being brought near to the table of David, eating. This idea of nearness and forgiveness I haven't even started preaching yet, but it's going to start here in a minute. This is not theoretical. This is practical. I, 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 are you supposed to dare people in church? You're not supposed to dare people. Are you? That's wrong. We don't dare. I challenge you. Next time you are at odds with someone, particularly your spouse, but if you're not married, it can be a friend. If you really want to be restored, just go and sit by them and see what happens. I'm dead serious. When you are in a, in a dilemma of relationship, just draw near. And if the power of God is at all there... Now, I know we can't control other people's actions, and if they are just dead set to have uh, uh, opposition, you know, I, I'm not saying this is a, a uh, you know, foolproof that's going to work in every time, but if there's any semblance of the work of God within that relationship, sometimes just the nearness opens an opportunity for conversation and redemption. Just go sit next to your spouse. Just sit on the couch right next to him. Any of you um, remember when you got married... Did any of you make that little commitment, we will never go to bed angry? None of you made that commitment? You are just beautiful people today. I love it. Maybe I just grew up different. I don't know. But Gene and I made that commitment that we would, you know, whatever the issues were, we would get them resolved before the end of that day. Now, I wish I could stand before you and say we've always done that. The Lord's still working on me, friends. I... <laughs> We, for the most part, have, but there's been some rough patches along the way. But one of the dynamics of that is it's hard to lay next to someone in bed that you're at odds with. That nearness almost forces discussion and resolution, not in every case. There's a tactic I use sometimes. I, I learned this years ago. I probably read it in a book. I have honestly forgotten it. Now, don't take this the wrong way, any of you that I serve on committees or boards with, but I've done this many times, and I'm just, I'm amazed. This is a secret, by the way. This is just between you and I. Let's shut down the camera for a minute. We're not going to record this. Let's just stop that. No, I'm just kidding. No, this, is, this is real. Um, on, on boards and committees, I have learned if there's someone where we've had a difference of opinion, and it's not just about business, but it's becoming personal, I make it my point to sit next to them at the next meeting. And now all of you are wondering, is that why pastor sat next to me at the last board meeting? <laughs> this doesn't mean it in every case, okay? 
But there's been a couple of times, and I could give uh, details where, I mean, there just wasn't just an issue, and it was growing personal, and I was trying to figure out how to resolve it, and there was a, a, a lady in particular. I sat right next to her. You know when you're sitting between, Dan, DF, if I can use your, when you've got a barrier between you, like a desk or something like that, it's really easy for us just to go at people. But when you're sitting next to them, it's harder to be angry. It's harder to disagree. Thank you for letting me use you today. I'm telling you, this is, this is a, a, just a very practical reality. And when God says, draw near, He knows there's something real in the heart that if there's any hope of redemption at all, that when you are close in proximity, there's an opportunity for the Holy Spirit to do things that are not as possible when there's distance. Okay. Through most of the stories that we've been looking at that illustrate forgiveness, I have really tried to let the stories, for the most part, speak for themselves. And I, I've given some, some uh, 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 you know, anecdotes and lessons and things like that along the way, but looking at the story of forgiveness and healing of the man that's brought to Jesus and the roof is opened up, I want us to spend just a few moments this morning, this afternoon, <laughs> Uh, reflecting on this story and seeing what we can learn. Now, it's not common, but I'm going to read this story. It's very brief. I'm going to read it from all three Gospels that it's found, and they're listed here. If you have your Bibles, you can turn with me. Um, I'm not going to race through the passages, but I just want you to hear how Matthew, Mark, and Luke all describe the moment that this man is brought near to Jesus, where he's brought near to the King. He's brought near to the Savior. And, and just to hear how the Scripture says it. So, I'm going to start reading. The first one here is in Matthew 9. You can open your Bibles, follow along, or just listen. You're going to be familiar with the story. But one thing I want you to listen for is see if you can notice any differences between the gospel records or just what stands out to you. Matthew 9, verse 1, "'Getting into a boat, Jesus crossed the sea and came to His own city. And they brought to Him, they brought to Him, a paralytic lying on a bed. Seeing their faith, Jesus said to the paralytic, Take courage, son, your sins are forgiven. And some of the scribes said to themselves, This fellow blasphemes. Jesus, knowing their thoughts, said, Why do you think evil in your hearts? What's easier to say, Your sins are forgiven, or to say, Get up and walk? But that you may know that the Son of Man, that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. Then he said to the paralytic, Get up pick up your bed and go home. And he got up and went home. But when the crowd saw this, they were awestruck and glorified God who had given such authority to men. This is one of the rare times when Matthew's version is, is the shortest of them, but I think it is in this story. We're going to jump over to Mark. Notice these are all taking place early, all of them. They're the same story. This story takes place early in Jesus' ministry, um, not too long after he had publicly revealed himself as the Messiah. Mark chapter 2. Just going to read it again now from Mark. Mark chapter 2 and verse 1. When he had come back to Capernaum several days afterward, it was heard that he was home. And many were gathered together, so there was no longer room, not even near the door. And he was speaking the word to them. And they came bringing to him a paralytic carried by four men. Being unable to get up or being able to get to him because of the crowd, they removed the roof above him. And when they had dug an opening, they let down the pallet on which the paralytic was lying. Jesus, seeing their faith, said to the paralytic, "'Son, your sins are forgiven.'" But some of the scribes were sitting there and reasoning in their hearts, why does this man speak this way? He's blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone. Immediately, Jesus, aware of this spirit that they were reasoning within themselves, He said to them, why are you reasoning these things in your hearts? Which is easier to say to the paralytic, your sins are forgiven, or to say, get up, your pal get up and pick up your pallet and walk. But so that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins, He said to the paralytic, I say to you, get up, pick up your pallet, and go home. 
He got up and immediately picked up the pallet, went out in the sight of everyone, and they were all amazed and glorifying God, saying, we have never seen anything like this. Second time, very similar, not a lot of differences, maybe a little bit of chosen language or, or uh, additional uh, detail, but not very different. Last one, Luke 5. It's not at the beginning of the, ver- of the chapter. This one's in the middle, starting in verse 17. Luke chapter 5 and verse 17. One day he was teaching, and there were some Pharisees and teachers of the law sitting there who come from every village of Galilee and Judea, from Jerusalem. And the power of the Lord was present for him to perform healing. And some men were carrying on a bed a man who was paralyzed, and they were trying to bring him in to set him down in front of him. But not finding any way to bring him in because of the crowd, they went up on the roof and let him down through the tiles with his stretcher into the middle of the crowd in front of Jesus. Seeing their faith, he said, friend, your sins are forgiven you. The scribes and the Pharisees began to reason, saying, Who is this man who speaks blasphemies? Who can forgive sins but God alone? But Jesus, aware of their reasonings, answered and said, Why are you reasoning in your hearts? Which is easier to say, Your sins have been forgiven you, or to say, Get up and walk. But so that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins, He said to the paralytic, I say to you, Get up, pick up your stretcher, and go home. Immediately he got up before them, picked up what he had been lying on, and went home glorifying God. And they were all struck with astonishment and began glorifying God. They were filled with fear, saying, we have seen remarkable things today. Now, on just such a quick reading of those three references, I wouldn't pin you down and say, now tell me everything that's the same or different about them. You may have picked up on a couple of things. You may have said they're pretty much all the same, and that's fine. It's, it's part of our journey in Bible study to, to look at these things and compare and contrast. For most of us that grew up in the church, this is a fairly uh, memorable story. It's unique. It's early in the ministry of Jesus. He has many healings, many interactions, but it's unique for several reasons. But one of the primary reasons that draw me, draws me to it is the additional or the beginning moment of Him proclaiming forgiveness to an individual that you would have said is not there for forgiveness. He's there to be healed. He's on a pallet. He's on a stretcher. He's being hauled around by friends on a, on a, on a stretcher. But Jesus in that moment, He throws a bit of a curveball in it, and He pronounces forgiveness and shows at first little indication at all that His plan was to perform a healing. So that makes us pause, that makes us say this story has a a different element to it that might be worth evaluating. Now, if we had all day and all other types of opportunities, we could really get into these stories, and I I apologize that I can't really get every angle, and and each of these elements is worthy of our analysis. Why why was this paralytic in this position to begin with? What was his plight? Uh, How was it that he was drawn to Jesus? What was it that the, the, the Spirit did to pull him to that? The persistence of friends is a great part of this story, and you have friendship evangelism uh, uh, illustrated in this, the willingness of the friends to go to this effort, uh, the patience of Christ. Can you imagine if all of a sudden we were just having a nice worship service here, and, and you start going, what's that sound? And someone was up there with a shovel banging through the, the church roof, and all of a sudden the light opens up. You, you know, you have to get into the story to kind of imagine that this, this didn't just happen immediately. This was a process. At some point, they had to have learned and heard and seen this scene coming up and the patience of Christ to allow that to happen. You can imagine the perspective of a lot of onlookers is, who are these guys taking cuts? I'm trying to get close to Jesus too. It says the crowds were pushing in. They couldn't get there. And the idea of this ostentatious moment of someone literally ripping open a building in order to bring this poor soul to Jesus. You can imagine that that would have irritated some people. Who are they? Aren't my needs just as important? Maybe I should break down some doors. Maybe I should rip open some roofs. So there's some beautiful uh, things to think about in the context of the realism of the story. The presumption of the Pharisees. And they're they're mentioned in, in several ways. The promise of forgiveness, son, your sins are forgiven. They are forgiven. And obviously the power of God 
in the healing of a paralytic. Now, of all these things and all the ways of analyzing and, and trying to understand the principles of forgiveness and what is happening in this story, I'm just going to hone in on just one element with you this morning before I let you go. I want to talk about the presumption of the Pharisees. It's not the most exciting angle. <laughs> it's not the most uh, uh, appealing side of this, but I think it's very important. In most of the stories of the Bible that illustrate, you know, what God is doing, we love to relate with the down and out. We love to relate with those who've been oppressed. We love to relate with those who are receiving mercy, and we say, oh, that was me, and oh, I was this. But in many of the stories, if you have grown up in a context of faith, if you've grown up in the context of the boundaries of religion, we need to realize that many of the stories of the Pharisees are about us. It's easy to want to relate with the man who was forgiven, right? Oh, I know what it's like to suffer. I know what it's like to need help from friends. I know what it's like to want to get close to the Lord and have the promise of His forgiveness. And that's fine and that's wonderful. But if you read the three Gospels, the main characters in this story are Jesus and the Pharisees. The paralytic never speaks, not one word. His name is never mentioned. Yes, they are a critical part of the story that couldn't have happened. The main dialogue, the main uh, description, the main uh, interaction is between Jesus and the Pharisees. The man never says a word. He's, he's dropped down. He's forgiven. He's healed. He walks and goes home. Great. Hallelujah. You know, the story, uh, uh, again, and how we want to relate to stories, even stories that we've mentioned here in this series on forgiveness, like the prodigal son. We want to relate to the prodigal son. You know, all that one who makes poor decisions. I've made poor decisions. I've wandered away, and I'm so glad I have the hope of the father and the love that if I return, he'll welcome me. And that's wonderful, and that's fine. But the story of the prodigal son begins with the words, there was a man who had two sons. It's not the story of the prodigal son. It's the story of the prodigal sons. And at the end of the story, the, the prodigal son is welcomed back into the home while the elder son is brooding outside the home and does not go into the celebration at the end. We need to see it from both sides. We need to see how God is working redemption and forgiveness, not just for the down and out, not just for the wanderer, but for those who think they have it all worked out. And they don't. They don't. If you still have Luke, I, I, I left off in Luke, notice this is probably the main difference in how each of these stories are told in the Gospels. Luke gives a detailed description of who was present at this miracle when it started. Luke 5, 17, one day he was teaching and there were Pharisees and teachers of the law sitting there. They'd come from every village in Galilee and from Judea and Jerusalem. Luke goes out of his way to say this was a moment in time when Jesus had the attention of the entire leadership body of a great vast area of, of the religious community. And it was in that moment that this story takes place, and Jesus uses it as a moment to deal with the presumption of the Pharisees, among other things. And the entire uh, criticism of the Pharisees draws out. They presumed that if you were sick and paralyzed, it was because you were a sinner and you pretty much deserved it. They presumed that Jesus was not God and could not forgive sins. They presumed that Jesus was evil. And Jesus wanted to tackle these presuppositions, these presumptions, and try to bring out a greater understanding of the work of God that He was trying to do on planet Earth. So, I'm going to do this just quickly here. The, the presumption, is Jesus God? They didn't believe that He was God. That's why Jesus, he, did Jesus know what He was doing? I mean, come on. He knew exactly what He was doing. When the man is lowered from the roof after that dramatic moment and all of the attention that that probably garnered, and every eye is watching, every person is seeing, what will the Messiah do? What will this Jesus character, what will this person who claims to be the Son of Man do? 
And Jesus looks down on him and he says, take courage, son, your sins are forgiven. You know, I happen to believe, I'm, I'm kind of a passive-aggressive person, uh, that's, you know, for better or for worse, you know, it's not always a good thing to, to be passive-aggressive, but you kind of see in other people's qualities that you have in yourself. I happen to think Jesus was passive-aggressive. <laughs> I do. I think He was passive. When Jesus was, when He looked down, now, not that He didn't have pity and compassion, Greta, on this man. I get it, okay? I realize that. But I kind of think He was kind of looking out of the corner of His eye at the Pharisees like I'm looking at Mark. Not that you're a Pharisee. And He was going, <laughs> watch out. Your sins are forgiven. Now, again, I, I, I understand the dramatization, and you've got to be careful with embellishment. But Jesus knew exactly, like when He would heal people on the Sabbath, He knew He was trying to get the attention of the religious community to say, you're thinking about this wrong, and I need to correct it. Jesus looks down at this man and says, I have the power to forgive. Don't, don't forget, like I, I shared previously, Jesus proclaimed forgiveness knowing that He had a cross in front of Him that would pay that price. And uh, so when he proclaimed forgiveness, he was willing to pay the price of the sins of everyone he forgave, even though he hadn't even done it yet. Son, your sins are forgiven. He knew that he would be annoying the, presumpt the presumptions of the religious community. Can sinners be forgiven? Again, the presumption is they were in such a state, they had gone so far from mercy, they had allowed such devastation to come into their life. This was the thinking of anyone who was sick, diseased, broken, um, out of the, the, the cultural norms. The idea that they even could be forgiven was outside of the thinking of the Pharisees. Now, we have matured as a culture and community. We no longer, praise the Lord, look upon those who are diseased or broken or have afflictions like this, that that's the work of God. Now, sometimes people still do, but that's just, you know, as a community, as a church, we don't think that way. We understand science and, 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 and the human body differently. But do we have a perfect record when it comes, as a tr Christian community, to identifying those who are forgivable and not forgivable? Or do we still have our presumptions? The time came when people approached Jesus and they said, I am LGBTQ. Can I be in your presence? You telling me there's Christians today that wouldn't have a problem with that? Or do we still have some presumptions? Time, time came when someone wanted to draw near to the Lord, and they said, I am not a Christian. I am a happy Muslim, but I'd like to know more about you. Do we not have presumptions within the Christian community about those outside the Christian faith? Time came when someone wanted to draw near to the Lord, and they said, I'd like to draw near to you, but I'm a, I'm a tax collector. No, tax collectors are still sinners. I get that. That's fine. Jesus is challenging the presumptions of the religious community, and He is saying, do not withhold from me the power to forgive anyone who draws near into my presence. Don't condemn them arbitrarily because they don't fit your model of understanding who God is. Let my power reign on the earth. And the whole dialogue that he has with them, he is making this dramatic statement of, I am the Son of God. And he hadn't even healed him yet. He hadn't healed him yet. He'd forgiven his sins, and in a way, that soul healing, that soul restoration uh, uh, was, was significant. It was the most significant. But Jesus adds to that, his overwhelming power of also being able to heal the paralytic. So the forgiveness was the pathway to the wholeness and healing that he also needed. Sometimes there's a distance between forgiveness and healing. I want you to think about this. Now, hypotheticals are dangerous. I get it. But I want you to think about something. Had there not been resistance to Jesus forgiving him, would the healing had also followed? 
Had Jesus simply said, boy, I can see your heart is overcome with fear and anxiety over the sins that you have had, and I'm going to proclaim forgiveness. Had there not been a pharisaical moment where people objected to this man's forgiveness and objected to the Son of God proclaiming forgiveness, the story makes it sound like it was only after people doubted him that Jesus was like, okay, because you doubt me. And he says that in all three Gospels. He says, so that you may know that the Son of Man has the power to forgive sins, I say to you, pick up your pallet, walk, and go home. But there was distance between forgiveness and restoration. Now, in this story, the, the, the story ends with the man being healed, but does it always end that way? And I didn't have uh, as much opportunity, but the story of Mephibosheth is actually a very good mirror to this story that crippled man who's brought to David, that crippled man who is restored to the fellowship of the king and becomes the king's son and eats at his table. Was Mephibosheth healed? He continues to be a cripple. Will Mephibosheth be in heaven? I can't wait to meet him, actually, because I think he's going to be there. Is he going to be crippled in heaven? So while God marries together forgiveness and healing in many stories, it doesn't always happen that physical healing automatically will take place when God performs the miracle of forgiveness. Not to go all Disney on you, but there are times that Disney does a pretty good job. You've you've seen The Lion King. Have you seen The Lion King? Vanessa, you've seen The Lion King. So ask Vanessa later if you're confused. In The Lion King, Simba is not with his family anymore. He has exiled himself, and the, the little wizardly uh, monkey, uh, Rafiki, what, what is he, uh, a bab- or ma- he's a mandrill, isn't he? Man- yeah, I've, I've got Pastor Jean confirming for me. He was a mandrill. Uh, Irma, I'm sorry. Do I have it wrong still? Rafiki, don't get me confused. Rafiki comes to him, and he's trying to convince Simba, you need to go back. You need, your, your family's in trouble. You need, and Simba's just feeling all this guilt from blaming himself for his father's death. He says, I just can't let it go. I, I can't do it. Rafiki takes his stick and whacks Simba in the head. Remember that? See, Vince, you know it's your favorite movie. Don't sit there like you don't know. He whacks him in the head. And Simba goes, ow, what'd you do that for? And he says, it doesn't matter. It's in the past. And Simba goes, yeah, but it still hurts. He says, yes, sometimes the past does still hurt. But he says, you need to learn from this, and you need to understand that you can't let your past, you know, big old Disney speech, and he wins the day, and everyone's happy in the end. But that, that, that little illustration of just because you've been forgiven or you've expressed forgiveness doesn't mean the pain goes away immediately. And the deeper the wound, you even though you can express or receive forgiveness, you might still have pain. It might not, the healing may not come immediately. And some of the pain and some of the healing won't come until Jesus comes. Because when Jesus comes, it will be like when He came the first time. When Jesus came the first time and was on earth, He illustrated full restoration. And full restoration will also come when Jesus comes the second time. But we can learn from this story from the perspective of those who did not think someone could offer forgiveness or that someone could receive forgiveness. And Jesus repeats those three times so that you may know I am the Son of God. I am the Redeemer. I'm going to perform this miracle, but the greater miracle took place first. The proclamation that your sins are forgiven. He laid there in a forgiven state despite the fact he was still paralyzed. Despite the fact he was still paralyzed, he was forgiven. And it was the Lord's intention and the Lord's desire to use that moment to heal not just the paralytic, but to get the attention of the religious community that was watching and say, stop judging people. Stop withholding forgiveness 
and withholding the grace of God from people that you've deemed irredeemable. He wanted to heal their hearts just as much as He wanted to heal that paralytic. So I like what Mrs. White says in Desire of Ages. It doesn't end that way, we understand. There were some that would turn to Jesus, but, but most of the religious community would continue to struggle. Physical disease, however malignant and deep-seated, was healed by the power of Christ, but the disease of the soul took a firmer hold upon those who closed their eyes against the light. Leprosy and palsy were not so terrible as bigotry and unbelief. It's very... Uh, in your face and kind of when it's said like that. But in this beautiful story of forgiveness, don't just look at the individual and the experiences he went through. Look at the greater story of what Jesus was trying to do to change the hearts and minds of the religious community. Because you and I, we are the religious community. And from time to time, we need to look through the eyes of those also who struggled to understand who Jesus was and see how the Son of Man and how the power of God is able to forgive anyone who draws near to Him. Amen? Anyone who draws near to Him has the promise and the power of the grace of God. Do you want that promise too? Do you want to have His forgiveness? How do we draw near to God today? We do so in our worship, in our prayer, by faith, in our Bible study, in the fellowship that we have together. We can draw near to the grace of God, and in that nearness, He touches and changes our hearts and helps us see with the eyes of heaven. Let's pray. Father, as we draw near to You right now, Lord, we just ask that You would change our hearts again. Help us to see as You see. These stories we become familiar with if we've been in the church for any length of time, and we can always study them again and see new and new angles and perspectives. But Father, in the appreciation of who You are and what You've done, help us to see also that we can sometimes also suffer from the same judgment and the same perceptions and presumptions that Your church did back then as well. Free us, Father, from the, any type of uh, presuppositions. Help us to be those friends that would bring others to You, that would draw near, that would not let anything keep us from being close to You. Father, make us a community that draws near and experiences Your grace and mercy. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you so much for being here, and we just hope that you have a wonderful day. You're always welcome to come worship with us again next week. Have a wonderful Sabbath.